Hey everyone, I'm Nikki Young and this is Serial Napper, an international true crime podcast. Family is supposed to be your safe space, the people who love you no matter what, the people you can trust, but unfortunately it doesn't always work out that way. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Lin family, who moved from China to Australia for a better life and then tragically lost theirs. The only survivor of this brutal murder that we're going to be talking about was the only daughter, Brenda Lynn, who was away when her family was slaughtered. So who would commit such a heinous crime? The answer was much too close to home. Tonight's episode is sponsored by We Love Pets at welovepets.eu.com. I'm so happy to have such an awesome pet product company as a sponsor. You guys, they have the cutest products for your dog or your cat. Things that you don't even know that you need until you see it, trust me. And if you're anything like me with your pets, you know, a pet parent who loves to spoil and pamper your fur baby, you'll want to check out the We Love Pets website too. They have all of the basics that you need to care for your pet, including toys, grooming tools, cages, and beds, but they also have some of the cutest and most innovative products for those pet owners who are a little extra. I'm talking about the cutest outfits, toys, beds, and more. Check out welovepets.eu.com and use the promo code SERIALNAPPER30 to take 30% off your order by February 28th. That's welovepets.eu.com and use the promo code SERIALNAPPER30 to take 30% off your order by February 28th, 2021. All right, let's jump in. The Lin family consisted of the father and head of household, Min Lin, who was 45 years old, his wife, Lily Lin, who was 43, their daughter, Brenda, 15, and two sons, Henry, 12, and Terry, just nine years old. Min and Lily had moved to Sydney, Australia from China to grow their family after they finished up their schooling. When they first made the big move, they struggled a lot financially, and they wanted to be able to provide a life for their children. So Min and his wife, Lily, opened a successful family-owned news agency. I've seen it called a news agency, which seems to be an Australian term for convenience store. The store really grew and flourished. Min dedicated his life to making sure that it did. In fact, it was said that he went into the store to work every single day, even on his days off. He was a really hard worker, and he was very proud of everything that he had accomplished. The store was so successful, it brought in about a million dollars in revenue each year. Even though they were doing financially well, the family lived in a very modest home on a quiet suburban street in North Epping. The Lins were very family-oriented. They had a lot of family living close by. Min helped his parents to migrate to Australia as well, and he bought them a home nearby, about a 30-minute drive away. Very typical in Asian families for the children to make sure that their parents are well taken care of when they become elderly. Min's sister, Kathy Lin, and her husband, Robert Z, also lived in Sydney, and they had a house practically across the street from the Lins. It was only about 300 meters away, so even though they were all living far from their roots in China, they had each other to rely on. On July 17th, 2009, the Lin family goes over to Min's parents' house for dinner. This was something that they did every Friday. No matter what was happening, they'd always make sure that they would all get together for dinner on Friday nights. The only member of the Lynn family who wasn't there was 15-year-old Brenda. Brenda was away on a school trip in New Caledonia, France. The following day, which was July 18th, it was fairly early in the morning when Min's sister Kathy began to receive phone calls from customers who were asking why the convenience store wasn't open. It was always open for business, especially on busy Saturday mornings, and it was definitely not normal for Min to not have gone to open it up. She knew immediately that something wasn't right, so she walked over to the Lynn family residence with her husband, Robert. Remember, it was just a three-minute walk from her home. When they arrived, they found that the front door was unlocked, so they walked in and called out to their brother. No answer, but everything appeared to be relatively normal. 
There were shoes at the front door. They saw the kids' backpacks, keys in the bowl at the front table, all the regular stuff that you would usually see. Kathy walked upstairs and she screamed out in absolute horror at what she saw. In the master bedroom, she found Lily drenched in a pool of blood. It looked like she had been bludgeoned to death by a weapon, something that appeared to be similar to a hammer. In the next room, Kathy found her other sister, Irene, who was living with the Lynn family at the time. Irene had also been bludgeoned to death by a blunt object. She ran from room to room, trying to see what she could find, and came across Min and Lily's two young sons, 12-year-old Henry and 9-year-old Terry, who were also murdered in a similar fashion. There was blood splattered all over the walls, indicating that in this room there was a struggle. Only Brenda, who was away on that school trip in France, was spared from the murder. Remember, Brenda was on her trip completely unaware of the horror that happened in her home. Kathy called 911, and I have a clip of the call that I'll play for you now. It's not the whole clip, just a portion of the clip, because during the initial call, Kathy was absolutely frantic, and it's really difficult to understand what she's saying. In this clip, I believe she calls 911 back after being disconnected and speaks to the operator. Thank you, police emergency. This is Tim. How are you? Yeah, what's um, your address? Epping North? Epping North. What's wrong? I need to watch this come crazy. We are I'm coming. Crazy. You need to stop screaming and tell me what the problem is. Yeah, I think so. Too. My brother's in San Someone killed my brother in Why do you think that? Yeah, because I went to his house and I knocked the bar and the door is um, just because I don't open it. And then up the stairs, find my brother. I couldn't find it. I'm not sure. Where's your brother? I could. I just found my brother. He's just in the lines. I think someone is trying. Are they on the ground? Oh, pardon? Are they on the ground? No, no, no. They're in the bedroom. They're all in the bedroom. Are they? Are they in the house? Is your brother in the house? I'm not sure because I just have a just a quick look at him. He's so the body. I know. I just have to call you. Have you found, have, we are driving there. Answer my questions, please. Have you found uh, a body? I'm, it's, it's my brother's home. Have you found a body? Yes, I went to his home and upstairs to check it because, uh, um, but he, he jumped in the open and uh, he said, uh, 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 he's the agent and someone is called me and after, I just go to check and uh, I found a uh, quick... We are driving there. Don't say quick. Tell me what's wrong. Have you seen your brother? I, I'm not sure because in the middle, I just... I thought We're I already driving. driving there. You don't need to worry. We're on the way. But can you see your brother? I'm not sure. No, it's yes or no. Can you see no, him? I, I, no. Is he in the house? Pardon? Is your brother in the house? I'm not sure. No, it's yes or no. Have you seen him no, in the house? No, I, I didn't see. I didn't see him. But what, why do you think he's dead? I'm a bit confused. Because I saw the, my friend was just saying, Lord, the body, and they saw the um, just the Lord just saw the body, and they saw the two cousins and the two um, I, two my brother's sons body. So I thought they up there. I didn't see my brother. Uh, but can you see their body? Yeah, I saw. We're coming, we're on the way. You don't need to worry, we're on I the know, way. Call the ambulance. I'm not sure they're no. No, we're ambulance are on the way as well. Okay, thank you, thank you much. Police are in the street now, they'll be there in ten seconds. Are you outside the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you out the front? Outside yeah, front. The sideway. Can you see the police? Yes, they're driving there right now. They'll have their lights on. So some people have said that they thought the nine one one operator was quite rude on the call and I guess I can see that he could have been a little bit I guess nicer but they're trained to get the information that they need they're trained to sound calm in these situations and so where she's panicking and she sounds you know hysterical he sounds very flat and that might come off as rude but I can kind of see from their perspective as to how he is trained to get the information he needs as much detail from her as possible so he's trying to get as much information as he can 
to pass on to the police because the police don't know what they're coming up on. They don't know if there's maybe someone with a weapon, if there's someone in the house. They don't know what they're coming up on. So the operator needs to get as much detail as they can. Now, when police arrive, it was described as one of the grisliest crime scenes in all of New South Wales history. I always think about the first responders and what they have to see and how they have to see literally the most terrible things imaginable. I just, I really, I can't imagine the memories they must have of being at this particular crime scene, particularly in the case of the two little boys who were killed. So when police arrive on the scene, they're met by Kathy, who is standing outside of the home screaming. She's alone. Her husband, Robert, has decided to make the drive to go get Min's parents and tell them what happened, which is a little bit strange. This is a murder scene. And I mean, we don't know if there's maybe still an intruder in the house, but okay. Paramedics arrive, but it's clear that the victims, they've been dead for a while and there's no one alive to be saved. When police search the home, they find Lily in the master bedroom, lying on top of the sheets. Across the hall, they find Irene slumped up against her bed, covered in blood, and then they found the two boys bludgeoned in their beds. It appeared that they were likely attacked in their sleep. Initially, Min's body hadn't been accounted for, and they thought that maybe he had killed his family and then ran off. Kathy, she talked to police and she said to look under the duvet in the master bedroom. So the police, they go up to the master bedroom, they look under the duvet, and there they found Min's body. Kathy would tell police that she had said to look under the duvet because she just had a feeling that her brother was under there. Maybe she had seen a lump under the covers and just recalled seeing it. I'm not really sure where this feeling maybe came from. Now let's talk about some of the evidence that was found and documented at the scene. There were bloody shoe prints on the carpet determined to be around a U.S. size 8.5 to 10.5. Only one set of shoe prints, which led police to believe that the killer acted alone. These shoe prints were found in the hallways and in all of the bedrooms, except for Brenda's room. So, did the killer know that she wasn't going to be home? Is that why they didn't even bother to go into her room? There didn't appear to be any signs of forced entry to the home, leading police to believe that either the killer was let into the home by someone, or maybe they had a key. There didn't appear to be a weapon left at the scene, but police believe that it was a hammer or something similar to a hammer that was used to kill all of the victims. Blunt force trauma was the cause of their deaths, and four out of five of them also suffered neck compression injuries and asphyxia. So likely what happened is that they may have been suffocated in their sleep first and then beaten to death with a hammer. They believe that Min and Lily were murdered first, followed by Irene, who was killed in a very similar fashion, and the two youngest boys were killed last. And it also appeared that at least one of the boys was awake when he was killed, as there were signs that he really fought back and fought for his life. There weren't any bloody fingerprints found in the home. They were all sort of smudged and smeared, which led the police to believe that the killer likely wore gloves. After the killer finished murdering the family, he walked down the stairs and exited through the front door, leaving it unlocked behind him. Now, Brenda, ugh, poor Brenda. Remember, she was in France on that school trip when her whole family was killed, but news of the murder spread really quickly. Brenda actually discovered what had happened when a friend of hers, who was also on the trip, went on Facebook and found a news article. And Brenda... She recognized the photo of her home in the news story. Oh, I can't imagine finding out something so absolutely gut-wrenching this way. Brenda would later say, Being a prideful teenager, I did not say anything to my father. I just stood there awkwardly and thought to myself, It's just going to be a week. I'm going to see them again really soon. To this day, My biggest regret was not hugging my father and telling him I loved him to say thank you for being an amazingly loving and caring parent. (laughs) 
If you're tired of having the same old pet toys, outfits, and swag as everyone else in your neighborhood, you need to check out We Love Pets at welovepets.eu.com. They have a massive selection of fun and unique pet products that you will love. I have a few things on my list for my puppy, Tora. And if you love to spoil your animals, you're going to get them products that you'll both love at a great price. Make sure you check out welovepets.eu.com. They have so many cool products for both cats and dogs, so I've got you covered. And guess what, guys? For a limited time, you can save 30% off your order. No joke. Check out welovepets.eu.com and use the promo code SerialNapper30, all one word, to take 30% off your order by February 28th. That's welovepets.eu.com and use the promo code SerialNapper30 to take 30% off your order by February 28th, 2021. Now back to our story. Brenda, in France, well, she caught the next flight home, meeting her Aunt Kathy and Uncle Robert and her cousin at the airport. At this point, she had nowhere else to go. Her whole family was gone, just like that. And while she wished she could live in the family home by herself, she was only 15 years old. So she moved in with the Z's, including her Aunt Kathy and Uncle Robert. After the murders, Robert and Kathy actually became her legal guardians, and they also resumed operation of that successful convenience store business. Meanwhile, the police continued their investigation. There weren't a whole lot of leads to go on because there wasn't much evidence found at the scene. Police felt like this had to be more than just a burglary gone wrong. It felt really personal, so they began looking at possible connections that were closer to the family. Two of the people that were interviewed as part of the investigation were Robert Z and Kathy Lynn. Robert Z always said he was a former ear, nose, and throat specialist in China before moving to Melbourne in 2006. They had opened a restaurant in Melbourne, but when this new venture failed, they moved to Sydney and had been unemployed ever since. One theory the police developed quite quickly was that maybe Robert was jealous of all of the success that the Lynns were having. In all of the police interviews with the couple, Kathy seemed to remain calm, but Robert appeared to be really nervous. He stuttered when speaking, even though he was speaking in his native tongue, Cantonese. He wouldn't make eye contact, and he fidgeted a lot. He rubbed his hands. He told police the night of the murders he was home. He had dinner, he watched a bit of TV, he had a bath, and then he went to bed. Kathy confirmed this. Not the strongest of alibis when you have your spouse confirming things, but the police didn't have any solid evidence to really pursue pressing charges or to push things any further. And it was a really weird situation with Brenda now living with Robert and Kathy. Police knew that they had to really look into Robert quickly, but they also had to be quiet about it in order to keep Brenda safe. They ended up installing video cameras in the family home, which I'm like, whoa, like I don't know a whole lot about Australian law, but they must have had to prove that he was a major suspect in order to be able to install video cameras in a private home. Police carried out this video surveillance for six months before finding some footage that was, I guess, interesting. The video showed Robert cutting up a size 9.5 A6 sneaker box and flushing it down the toilet. This type of shoe matched the type of bloody shoe print that was found at the scene. Why the heck would he be cutting up this shoebox if he wasn't really going out of his way to try and hide something? Again, this was interesting to see, but of course still very, I don't know, circumstantial. Definitely not enough to make an arrest. It would take over a year for any breakthrough evidence to surface. During a forensic examination of Robert Z's garage in May 2010, Experts found a tiny stain on the floor of the garage that looked like blood. It was sent off to a specialty lab, and later analysis revealed that it contained DNA from four of the five victims. 
It's believed that Robert may have committed the murders, then returned to his garage to clean up and failed to notice the stain. Robert was subsequently arrested in May 2011. His wife Kathy and even Brenda herself maintained his innocence. Neither of them could believe that he would ever do anything to hurt the Lynn family. He was a family man. He was all about family. Why would he do this? Soon, he would go to trial, and he pled not guilty. The Crown said that Robert's motive for murder was that he was furious by what he perceived to be his status within the family. He was jealous of all of the success that Min was having. Back in China, Robert was supposedly a doctor, and now here in Australia, he was unemployed and he was struggling. An important part of the prosecution's case was that there was no forced entry into the home. And Robert, of course, he had a key to enter the home. So he may have used that key to enter quietly and attack his victims in their sleep, one by one. Another important piece was that whoever did this knew the layout of the home, and they likely even knew that Brenda would not be there because she was away on that school trip. That's why the killer didn't even bother, didn't even attempt to go into her room. Other evidence released by the court included photographs of those bloody shoe prints that were found on the carpet of the Lynn family home. Those impressions were matched to a particular model of shoe known to have been worn by Robert. And then there was that video of him destroying the shoe box and flushing the bits down the toilet. But... His legal team claimed that the shoe prints could have been created by more than one type of shoe. They also claimed that the shoe impressions could have been left by a number of different brands. So it wasn't just specific to this exact shoe that Robert wore. The prosecution also brought forward that blood stain that was found in Robert's garage that had DNA matching four of the five victims. Now this is what's called touch DNA. So it was DNA on something that was touched to something else. The defense refused to accept that the stain was actually blood, and they said the DNA could have been transferred to the garage floor in a number of different ways, totally unrelated to the murders. Then there was that footage played from the many interviews that Robert and Kathy had with police. Seriously, they were interviewed multiple times. The ones where Kathy was completely calm and Robert just didn't appear to be right. But there was also a few times during those interviews when Robert seemed to mess up his story a bit. In one of the interviews, he told officers that he had seen Min on the bed after his wife discovered the bodies, that he saw Min lying beside Lily. But Min's body was actually only discovered by police hours later because it was concealed by that duvet. Robert actually went as far as to call the officer in charge the following day because he was afraid that he had actually incriminated himself. Not exactly something that you would think an innocent man would do. And then what about Robert Lynn suddenly disappearing to go get Min's parents after he and Kathy find the bodies? To police and the prosecution, it seems like a really odd thing to do. And honestly, that seems like a really weird thing to do for me too. Like, why would someone leave a murder scene, to go pick up his in-laws who lived half an hour away. Wouldn't you want to stay and talk to police? And then you're leaving your wife there who is clearly shaken up, horrified, terrified. She's just found her family murdered and you're going to leave her to drive half an hour away to get the in-laws. Well, police, they thought this was weird too. And they believe that he used this time to dispose of the murder weapon and clean up any other evidence that may be found later. Police also brought in a surprise jail witness known only as Witness A. While awaiting trial, Witness A claimed that during the course of numerous conversations, Robert said things that suggested that he was responsible for the murders. This included allegedly talking about the hammer used in the murders, revealing that his wife was sedated on the night the crime took place so that, you know, she would sleep through the whole thing and not wake up and wonder where he was, and allegedly devising a number of plots to frame other people. It needs to be said, though, that Witness A was a shitty human being himself. 
He was also accused of threatening to murder a prison guard. So I don't know. And he was also going to receive a reduction in his sentence for testifying in the trial. I don't give a whole lot of weight to witnesses like this. It's like having one bad guy who lies testifying against another bad guy who maybe lies. Like that just doesn't really seem like a logical way to conduct a trial. Now, I want to note that there would be four trials before this thing was over. During the first trial, the jury was discharged when a possible sexual motive emerged. At the time, the victim refused to be identified. But years later, Brenda Lynn would come forward to identify herself as the victim of sexual abuse at the hands of her uncle, Robert. During one of the subsequent murder trials, it would come out that Brenda was subjected to serialized sexual abuse for the subsequent two years that she lived with Robert and Kathy. She had also been abused by her uncle prior to the murders. When asked later why she initially thought that she didn't want to disclose the abuse, Brenda told the court in 2015, I didn't want to do anything that would hurt my aunt as well, and I wanted my aunt to be happy. I just wanted my uncle to come back home so my aunt could live her life as normally as possible. Brenda only decided to make a formal statement about the abuse after speaking to a lawyer who had become a friend. This lawyer friend mentioned to her that if she didn't tell the jury the truth about what had happened and what her uncle did, then they wouldn't have the complete picture of who this guy was. When this news broke, it became an additional motive for the prosecution. Maybe he was worried Brenda might tell and that's why he killed the family. Or maybe it's because he wanted Brenda closer to him. Maybe it wasn't just about the jealousy of the Lynn family. Maybe it was about Brenda. One of the things that really bothers me about this is, remember police had video surveillance in that home after the murders, right? Trying to catch Robert doing something that might implicate him. Well, in a news article I read, there were several instances caught on this surveillance tape that showed Robert touching Brenda inappropriately, yet they didn't remove her from the home. Police said that the touching they observed didn't amount to molestation, but... Man, they think this guy is a murderer, capable of murdering two children even. And then they see this and they do nothing. Something about that just really bothers me. If I was Brenda, I would be angry and I don't know, I might even press charges. In the second trial, the jury was discarded because the judge suffered from health issues. In the third trial, the jury discharged after failing to reach a verdict. And Robert, he was released from prison on bail because he had spent almost five years behind bars without a conviction. It would take four trials to reach a verdict. This would have been an absolute nightmare for Brenda to have to go through the trial against her uncle this many times and over this length of time. She also felt like she still loved and needed her Aunt Kathy by her side, but it was impossible because it had now come to light that her husband Robert had been sexually abusing Brenda. Brenda was present in court at the sentencing, sitting just meters away from her uncle as the judgment was delivered. The judge, Justice Fullerton, said, I acknowledge the profound grief she has suffered and continues to suffer. I also commend her for her strength and dignity and her courage as she faces the future without her parents, siblings, or even a loving aunt. The final trial commenced in Sydney in June 2016. As in the previous trial, the jury was unable to reach a unanimous verdict, and the judge advised a majority 11 to 1 verdict would be accepted by the court. On January 12, 2017, a jury found Robert Z guilty of five counts of murder. He was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences in prison without the possibility of parole. Robert showed absolutely no emotion when the sentence was passed, learning that he would spend the rest of his life in jail. After he was sentenced, Kathy Lynn, his wife, continued to maintain her husband's innocence, telling reporters, he is a loving and caring family man. He was wrongly charged with a crime that he did not commit. He is a scapegoat. 
Now, there's actually been updates in this case just recently in February of 2021, like literally this month. Robert Z tried to appeal his sentencing. Three of the appeal grounds were related to that DNA sample that was found on the floor of his garage. Lawyers argued that it could have been DNA from several other living relatives, even including his wife, Kathy. But the judge at his appeal trial thought that he was the right guy. This was the right sentence. And so he lost his appeal. So for now, at least, that is where he will stay in prison. So what do you think? Do you think the right man is behind bars? Do you think the motive of jealousy and possibly wanting Brenda closer to him was enough to make him kill five people, including two children? And this is his family. I would love to hear what you think. That's it for me tonight. I would like to once again thank my sponsor. Check out welovepets.eu.com and use the promo code SerialNapper30 to take 30% off your order by February 28th. As for me, if you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook at SerialNapper. You can also search for me on Apple or Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Check me out on Twitter at Serial underscore Napper, or I'm on YouTube, Nikki Young, Serial Napper, all one word. And if you're listening on YouTube, I love if you can give me a thumbs up, a like, and subscribe. Until next time, don't be a Dahmer. Bye.